Good. Um, thank you all for coming at the start of our spring colloquium series. It's really lovely to see so many of you here. Um, get the feeling that you know things are going back to normal on campus. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, my name is Sanjot Mahendale. I'm the chair of the Tang Center for Silk Road Studies. Now. Our programming this year is entirely focused on the um, uh, transfer of scientific, medical, and technological knowledge along this network we now commonly refer to as the Silk Road. And it gives me uh, great pleasure that our first speaker uh, this spring is Brian Bauman. Uh, those of us who've had the pleasure of being his colleague or being his student at UC Berkeley will know Brian as a polyglot, a polymath. Um, anyone who's ever talked to Brian, it's like traveling the Silk Roads. You know, you can he makes connections between the Iranian between and the Turkic and the Buddhist worlds at a drop of a hat. Uh, whatever the journey. <laughs> Uh, in those conversations, it's always exciting, uh, and you often end up in very, very interesting places. So, um, in many ways, in my eyes, you are the, like the quintessential Silk Road uh, scholar. Now, for those who have not yet had the pleasure uh, of meeting him, let me fill you in on his uh, background and also his interests. So Brian uh, received his PhD um, from the Department of Central Eurasian Studies at Indiana University. Uh, and his dissertation uh, was entitled Divine Knowledge, Buddhist Mat Mathematics According to Antoine Mostart's Manual of Mongolian Astrology and Divination. He is currently a lecturer uh, in Mongolian studies in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures. Um, and he teaches a wide variety of classes and courses, uh, lots of language classes, elementary Mongolian, literary Mongolian. He also teaches on uh, Mongol history, uh, history of the Mongol Empire, Mongolian Buddhism, modern Mongolian history, the history of heaven, Buddhist astral science, Buddhism and the stars, and Mongolian Buddhist ritual. Uh, he speaks and understands a number of languages, including Khalkh Mongolian, um, he also knows uh, some Mongolian dialects. He has expertise in written Mongolian, including classical and pre-classical languages, uh, and also the, the very many Mongolian writing systems um, that have been historically used for the language. Um, and in addition, uh, reading proficiency in Chinese, Tibetan, Manchu, Old Turkic, and French, uh, and German, I saw. Um, I, so when I was reading his CV and I came to the part that said other relevant work experiences, and some of these were, yeah, that you expect that, Peace Corps, right? Um, interpreting and translating for Mongolian, um, US State Department, and then I got to AT&T Language Line Services. <laughs> And then I had to look that up, and I realized that those are the translation services uh, for people who are non-English speakers. Um, his research fields are broad, uh, Mongolian language, history, and culture, the, Mongolian, uh, the Mongol Empire, Inner Asian Buddhism, 20th century and modern Mongolia. He's, of course, very interested in the medieval sciences, mathematics, astral sciences, appropriate for today, time reckoning, medicine, botany, comparative religion, Eurasian literature, and inner Asian music. Um, he has many, many publications. I'll just mention a few um, uh, among his, his books. Uh, in 2008, was published Divine Knowledge, Buddhist Mathem Mathematics According to the Anonymous Manual of Mongolian Astrology and Divination. To the Anonymous. Anonymous Manual of Mongolian Astrology and Divination, uh, published in Leiden by Brill. And then in preparation are The Illumination of the Mind, a Sakya Buddhi Buddhist uh, treatise on salvation in pre-classical Mongolian verse, and also Where Angels Fear to Tread, an Uneven Course to the Science and History of Heaven and Hell. Uh, an article that is uh, in preparation still, I think, is The Science of Time 
and why it matters. Uh, and on that note, uh, I want to invite Brian to, to give his talk. And remember the first part of your abstract, time is of the essence. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you. That's really, thank you, Sancho. That's great. Oh, um, uh, I'll just go. Uh, so here goes. I would like to thank you all for coming today. I would like to thank the Tong Center for Silk Road Studies for having me, and Sanjo and Frank for putting this together. Mandi is uh, always. So uh, 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 this talk comes in the wake of the Buddhism, Physics, and Philosophy Redux Conference Bob Scharf put together for us last semester. I really enjoyed that conference. It made me feel so fortunate to be among you all here this Berkeley community. So at the conference, there were several papers on philosophy of time, but nothing simply on the science of time. It was different. That's my topic for today, the science of time. So we want to learn the science of time, but first let's learn what science is. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, science is what we know. This is not how we tend to know science today, however. Science, since the, mid, uh, uh, since the mid 19th century, we have thought of science as this. I'll let you guys read it, you can, you can get it. Uh, science, not quite science, something different, all right? So uh, since the mid 19th century, we have thought of science as this thing here. Notice that the two, defini the two definitions are antithetical. There is no science whatsoever in this second definition of science. It refers not to knowledge, but an activity. So the redefinition came in the wake of Newton's achievements, which are familiar to us. For Newton himself, what we now call science was not science at all, but natural philosophy. The difference between science and philosophy is profound. Science, Bertrand Russell tells us, is what you know. Philosophy is what you don't know. So modern science concerns what we do not know. How did that mountain get there? I don't know. Let's engage, let's engage in the activity of making inquiry and see what we can see. To know the science of time, we need not begin in nescience. We can begin with what we know. And so what is it that we know? We know the void, that when we, <laughs> Anyway, we know the void, that when we leave this wrecked vessel we call civilization behind and venture out into wilderness, what we find is not utopia, but wilderness, a wild that bewilders us with its abiding state of one and undifferentiated chaos. Science knows the void, and it knows how to overcome it, for a while anyway. So we fix an arbitrary point of reference, we, we assume the center, we observe the horizon. We separate out one thing from another according to its genius, and so on. So this science we apply to the genesis of a created world, our collective age of man. So now time. We know two definitions of time. Heterogeneous, Scherbatsky calls them, as to be the negation of the other. The Oxford, Oxford English Dictionary gives its first definition as this. Notice, please, its finitude, a finite extent. See that? So um, um, now, the second definition is this. Notice, please, the time here is not necessarily without duration, but the duration is not the point. A metonym for time and a word that might be related to it etymologically is tide. The ocean tide embo uh, embodies both aspects of time both of these things. It ebbs and flows from points low and high in irregular patterns that vary from place to place. Here's the tide chart for San Francisco. Though contradictory, we know, we know time as duration and time as occasion both. We know them intimately, innately. We don't have to think about it. In an old country western song written by Don Gibson, Ray Charles sings, they say that time Heals a broken heart, but time has stood still since we've been apart, and you guys can sing the song. So, uh, obviously, though at any time we can easily differentiate time as duration and time as occasion, time cannot mean both duration, duration and occasion at the same time. In general, we tend to associate time with one definition or the other. These, associa these associations can be cultural. When English speakers say, I have no time, the meaning is that one is very busy. 
This is because we generally associate time with duration, not occasion. In the East, it has traditionally been just the opposite. The Mongolian phrase, yamart tsak bakwe, I have no time, means, or used to mean, uh, uh, that one is not busy. This is because Mongolian tsak implies, or used to imply, an occasion, not duration. Interestingly, Oriental people, which is a funny way to start a sentence, um, uh, interestingly, Oriental people are a year older than Occidental people. And to ask them why, they say that since the child spends almost one year in the womb, a certain empty year passes before they're born. But the distinction is one of knowing time as occasion instead of duration. So the, contradic the contradictory nature of time is comprehensible when we arrive at a self-evident truth about motion and stillness. Motion is absolute. Stillness merely relative. Is that cup moving? It's flying through space, isn't it? It's really, really moving. It's, uh, uh, it, it, it's flying through space and every which way but loose. So scholars speak of eight types of motion, but the list is irrational. Our world is a world of flux. Things go around and round, expand and contract, ebb and flow, run and bounce, delve and dive. Time, that is to say, moments of relative stillness, occurs in all of it. Gillian Welch sings, throw me a rope on the rolling tide. So time as occasion is stillness in the midst of motion. When you are in time with something, there is stillness between you and the other. When you are out of time, there is motion. We are in time with the earth, so it happens, so it appears still to us. But if we were standing on the moon, we would be in time with the moon and the earth would be moving. All day long the sun moves across the sky, but at noon the sun stands still. As the moment breaks, if we perceive ourselves in time with the earth, the sun appears to start moving again. But if we stay in the moment with the sun, then the earth appears to be carrying us away. So, as a phenomenon of perception, time is of the animate. Only the living sense stillness. Who's ever heard of a still death painting, right? You, there's only a still life painting. So this, uh, this inanimate, uh, 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 the inanimate lack uh, sense to know stillness and so exist in a world of constant motion. We infer so paradoxically, uh, 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 we infer so because paradoxically it is the capacity of the animate to sense stillness that allows it to move. The sunflower, which is back here, uh, um, must at some molecular level know stillness, for it can move on its own in time with the sun. Rocks, on the other hand, have no sense of stillness. Theirs must be a world of constant motion, for they can't move. When we die, we are reduced to moving particles that go this way and that until our bodies melt away like snow. So how we perceive time is something of a mystery. Why do some events seem to take forever and others pass so quickly? Why do our thoughts wander and we daydream? Why do we dream at all? Marcel Proust wrote a long novel on the subject and much can be said about the perception of time. But here I would like to limit the discussion to but a few points. I understand the perception of time in terms of positing the center. For human beings, the perception of time is not so much relative to a given place or physical location as it is a given metaphysical center, a point. We can posit the center where we will or the center, as in the case of Proust in his Bite of the Madeleine, goes where it will involuntarily. In either case, our perception of time goes with it. In the eyes of the beholder, the locus of the center can be reflexive. We posit the center with ourselves. Doing so gives us a sense of self, a sense of our own existence, a sense of being present. The present is that time when we are in time with where we are. In the present, we abide in a moment of relative stillness with all points in the universe, but everything is constantly moving. Things that go away from the present exist in the past. Things that will eventually come into the present exist in the future. Over time, we, re we remain in the present, in relative stillness, with certain things, while other things move away and other things are yet to come. For encountering points both passing away and coming on, we feel ourselves constantly moving in the present as we occasion one event after another in a steady stream. 
the present has nothing inherently to do with chronological order. Though we were first present in time with the Earth thousands of years ago, being on Earth remains in our collective present. We visited the moon but a few decades ago, yet being on the moon is a thing of our collective past. A relationship exists between the time of an event and the place of its occurrence. Events that occur at a given time can only occur at a specific place. You can't, I don't really like Taylor Swift, but I'm going to, anyway. So you can't see Taylor Swift in California if she's performing in Florida, and you can't see her in December if she's performing in February. We all know that, uh, if, you know, anyway. In this, the relativity of time is a function not merely of perception, but place. The time, uh, uh, the time of an event occurs relative to the observer's point of observation. I have, here's our guy. Uh, Einstein demonstrated unambiguously that time as an event occurs relative to frame of reference. We think of this as Einstein's genius, but he was by no means the first to realize this. He simply moved the understanding of time in physics away from Newtonian philosophy. The relativity of time is scientific. It's a self-evident truth. The Greeks knew relativity as the defining quality of logos, which pertains to limited or relative truth. At mid-latitudes in the northern hemisphere, of the star Procyon, before the dog, the word means that, rises before Sirius, the dog star. Knowing this, in his Guide to World Cartography, Marinus of Tyre waxes relative in informing his readers that from, that from Africa and the, south, uh, and the southern hemisphere, Sirius rises before Procyon does. As a commonplace, the relativity of time was a term of art. Time of the gods meant a transcendent perception of time defined relative to a point of observation located beyond the dome of heaven, an external perspective known as God's eye view. In the time of man, that is from a point of observation on earth, it takes 360 sidereal days for a star to return to its original place in the sky. But from God's frame of reference, those 360 revolutions appear as but a single revolution, a single day. The Zoroastrian Vendida describes it just that way, yeah. it is with light. In India, the term for what we translate astronomy is geochirvidya literally the science of light. I love that. That should be a science here. So the science of light. Thanks to Oli Reamer, we know that light travels at a constant speed, 186,000 miles per second. But even so, thanks to Albert Einstein, we know that the speed of light in a vacuum is constant irrespective of reference frame. The same for all observers regardless of the motion of the light source or of the, uh, of the motion of the observer. If you turn on a light Light does not hit one wall before it hits another, but rather fills the room all at once. People perceive this innately and have always known to use light from celestial bodies to signify when things happen and where things are located on Earth. So to mark the time and place of his surrender, Chief Joseph said, my heart is sick and sad from where the sun now stands, not fight no more forever. The scientific way to denote what time and place light reflects is through allegory. So the blue dot on your phone signifies your location in real time. The allegorical signification of that dot is the constellation of satellites our techie overlords use to keep track of us. In, in a similar way, when read literally, the nursery rhyme, hey diddle diddle, is nonsense. But read as allegory, it teaches children at mid-latitudes of the northern hemisphere the stars of the summer sky. Time is one thing, using light from celestial bodies to tell time through allegory another, and keeping time, that is keeping temporal order from one occasion to another, is something else again. So for keeping time, we, re we rely on light from the sun. With sunlight as our source, the instrument we use to keep time is a gnomon. Uh, the word gnomon itself means that which knows, knows what time it is. In keeping time, a question arises as to the definition of duration that occurs in the interval from one occasion to another. One can try to use the hour intervals of a gnomon to ascertain this, but shadow lengths vary from place to place and day to day over the course of a year. A better way is to use a clock. 
A clock is a fabricated mechanism designed to move at a constant rate of motion. What defines that constant? Apart from the speed of light, things move constantly, not at a constant rate of, uh, of motion, but every which way but loose. Clocks are calibrated not to any natural rate of motion, but to an abstraction of natural motion, a mean average of some variable rate over a specified period. And I realize that what I have just said is refutable, but uh, we'll table that. So the, in 1967, they, they time it to cesium, and I will just leave that, all right? So traditionally, clocks were set to a mean average of temporal units over the course of a year. The Indian water clock, for instance, is a bowl of such size that given a hole in the bottom, it will fill with water in the, in the period approximating the mean average of all nomen hour units over the course of the year. That was a mouthful. Anyway, so set as it is to a mean average, the units of a clock hour are, ideally anyway, invariable. For this, a clock hour is different than the variable hours of a nomen. Against the clock, the duration of nomen hours changes from hour, hour to hour, day to day, latitude to latitude. The hour defined by a clock does not conform to any hour as defined by a nomen. It would seem that the two measures are incommensurate. The incomm this incommensurability suggests that the sun and the earth are not in time with each other, that each is moving in its own inimitable way. Uh, so for this incommensurability, it is said that whereas a gnomon defines a true or apparent representation of time, a clock defines a mean or abstract representation. So compare 12 p.m. to solar noon or midday. When is it noon? It's always noon somewhere. When is it 12 p.m.? Every now and then, here and there. Is it 12 p.m. anywhere on the face of the earth right now? No. But it is noon somewhere, right? Zoop. So 12 o'clock <coughs> is an abstraction. It's not the thing. All right? So um, according to Wikipedia, time in physics is defined by its measurement. Time is what a clock reads. Nothing proves the nescience of physics, and thereby modern science and the totality of modern thought, more than the fallaciousness of this definition. Clocks do not tell time. Allegory tells time. Neither do clocks keep the time of day. A gnomon does. Clocks tell mean time, an abstraction of time. The second, minute, hour, day, month, and year of a clock are one thing, and the periods of sun, moon, planets, and stars something else entirely. They say that even a broken watch is right twice a day, but the same might be said for a perfectly functioning atomic clock as well. Clocks cannot even keep mean time. Clocks are subject to the mechanisms by which they operate and external factors beyond their maker's control. A water clock gives one reading at 32 degrees Celsius and another at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Clocks move at different rates, give different measures, and quickly fall out of sync. Apart from random chance, none tells the actual time of an external event as reflected by light. Using clocks to tell time is like herding cats. They just go where they will. All right. So not only do clocks not tell time, they were not designed to. In antiquity, while a gnomon told the time of day, clocks were used to measure duration, usually at night. In ancient Mesopotamia, clocks were used to measure a degrees of sidereal motion in the determination of longitude. They were also used to mark the sentinel's beru, a watch in the night lasting 120 minutes duration. Clocks may not tell time, but they do do something. They define rate of motion, velocity, extent, period, distance, very, very accurately. If you set your cruise control to a fixed rate of motion, a clock will tell you uh, 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 very accurately the distance you have traveled over a given period. The same results cannot be achieved with a gnomon. Whereas a gnomon tells time perfectly, it gives a very uneven measure of duration. How uneven? This uneven. That's how different the two are. All right. So here we see that the function uh, uh, the, the, that the functions nomen and clock serve are complementary. The nomen tells time, time as an occasion. It does so in stillness. It is not designed to measure duration, and when used to do so, does so very imprecisely. Clocks, on the other hand, measure duration. 
They do so through motion. They are not designed to tell time, and when used to do so, do so very imprecisely. The complementary functions nomen and clock serve indicate a complementary relationship between time, time as occasion, and duration, duration of time. Both are real phenomena of nature. Uh, 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 in, uh, yeah. Both are, are, are real phenomena of nature, inextricably linked in the relativity of stillness in motion and the constant speed of light. They are nonetheless uh, qualitatively different things. This qualitative difference is apparent at the point of the infinitesimal, the definition of an instant. In Indian time reckoning, the term shana, instant, denotes two separate things, the briefest possible period of duration on the one hand and the moment without duration on the other. The distinction is seen in considering the time and duration of a flying arrow shot by a marksman in the instant it pierces a leaf. Two of, Z uh, of Zeno of Elia's paradoxes deal with the problem of time. He draws them to prove in complementary ways that time means momentary stillness. The paradox of the arrow states that a flying arrow is constantly at rest. The paradox of, of, of Achilles and the tortoise states that if time were nothing but motion, Achilles would never catch the tortoise because the moment he arrived at the place the tortoise had just been, the tortoise, the tortoise would be gone. The absurdity uh, to these paradoxes demonstrates the limits to logic. Logic gives that things are either still or moving but cannot be both at, at, at once. But the relativity of time defies this. Logic for its own sake yields results that in reality are untrue. That we know either everything or nothing. That nature is abjectly void or immutably ordered. That the world is subjective or objective and so on. Still, logic is not without utility. It solves problems of contradiction in space and time and can, and can be helpful with the question of constancy. Logic affirms that if a constant period between successive events did exist, then temporal regularity would be absolute. Time would be only of duration and not occasion, only of motion and not of stillness. Nature would hold its own immutable order. The void would be non-existent. Nothing would ever change. Things would always be the same. We would not live and die, we'd be alive, or we'd be dead forever. So eternity and everlastingness are apotheoses of time. For one whom time means only duration and not occasion, the eternal and everlasting are conflated. Scientifically, however, a distinction exists between them, whereof eternity is of the occasion, stillness. Everlastingness, duration, motion. Eternity means without beginning or end. To know an eternal moment, think of midnight. All day long, the sun has been moving through the sky. Time has been moving in the present, away from the past and towards the future. But at this one particular moment, as it did at noon, the sun sta stands still, now in the pit of hell. And with it, time. In a definition of the day by midnight, at midnight, past, present and future come together in a single moment that is at once yesterday, today, and tomorrow. At midnight, not only does time stand still, it has no beginning and no end. Midnight is an eternal moment. So this eternal nature to midnight we might perceive at any moment, though we tend to see time in mundane terms of duration instead. This distinction between uh, eternity and everlastingness was known. In ancient Egypt, light is eternal, darkness everlasting. In Hermopolitan cosmogony, Shu, god of yesterday, is eternal, and Tefnut, god of tomorrow, everlasting. Represented as twin lions, the trope disseminated widely through Chinese influence all the way to Durant Hall over there. So. So for Egyptians, the sun god, Amun-Re, is the, the lord of eternity who made everlastingness. Its symbol, the Ankh, a circle representing everlastingness emanating from the crux of a cross representing eternity, signified everlasting life for its bearer, Pharaoh, and the Egyptian world order. In history, a peculiar notion of everlastingness emerged in the concept of infinite duration or boundless time. In Anaximander, Kronos, time is said to be a peron, boundless. Greeks personify the concept in Zeus and Thony, 
In Indian thought, the term is kala, uh, uh, associated with Prajapati and then eventually the Buddhist Dharmapala, Mahakala. Among Iranians, the concept is de uh, uh, developed into the Zoroastrian cult of Zurvan. Zurvan is Father Time, Father of Ahura Mazda, God of Omniscience, Order, Light, and Good, and Angramainyu, God of Nescience, Disorder, dark Darkness, and Evil. So Mary Boyce argues that the cult, the, the, the cult of Zurvan developed as the dominant form of Zoroastrianism in Western Iran during the reign of Artaxerxes II. Though some deem it borrowed from the Egyptian cult of Amun-Re, whereas everlastingness to the Egyptians meant circularity, boundless time is linear. In Zurvanism, time means the three times, past, present, and future. The past being a time of an original cosmic separation of good and evil. The present, a limited time when good and evil are mixed. And the future, a time of perfect goodness, boundless time, and infinite light when death is overcome and the kingdom of God established on earth. Does that sound familiar to, to anyone? Yeah. So um, uh, boundless time is a seminal concept of the soteriological movement and common to all soteriological traditions of the Aramaic ecumene. Several de deities, Greek Zeus, Hebrew Yahweh, Buddhist Amitabha, uh, all related to Zoroastrian Ahura Mazda, Jupiter, came to personify everlastingness. Of the Hebrew Yahweh, Psalm 102 says, uh, I'll let you read it, all right? The heavens, they wear out, but this thing that's everlasting changes them. His years have no end, it doesn't change. What an idea, uh, that's an idea. So Yahweh tells us himself that what is everlasting in the world, this world, is not the void. What is everlasting in these faiths is eternal light. So light here is both eternal of the occasion, stillness, and of duration, motion. So though it conflates occasion and duration, faith in boundless time is not unjustified. For as John says, light shines in darkness, darkness hasn't overcome it yet, so hang in there. <laughs> so, but note the empirical difference between eternity and everlastingness. Despite political, political propaganda to the contrary, whereas any event might be eternal, nothing save the void is everlasting. Death is eternal. Everlasting life is a contradiction in terms. Lewis Carroll proved this point with a riddle. You know the riddle, right? Uh, an egg on a wall sits over time's duration in an imperfect state. We might think of it as being still, but it is ever moving, ever changing. Its sitting there will not last forever. But the breaking of the egg occurs in the stillness of an eternal moment in time. It will never come again. After the egg breaks, alas, not even the, all the king's horses and all the king's men can put Humpty Dumpty together again. So to touch upon self-evident now, sci scientific qualities of time, let's recognize that time is momentary. Apparent repetition and recycling over time's duration is merely similitude. Recurrence has, uh, 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 recurrence has to do with motion. Moving in flux, the moment things get back to where they once belonged, everything has changed. Every moment is like no other. The epigraph to the movie 2046 is, all memories are traces of tears. We're having time together just now, and just this time we're having shall never come again, right? So there it is. Now, time is undirected. In our daily lives, certain things appear to be caused by causes, and certain things appear to occur at random. In our faith, we believe that everything is ultimately caused by a cause and that nothing is truly random. But in, ti but in time, the opposite is true. Causation exists, but only to a limit. The first cause is the chaotic flux of nebulous void. Its incessant writhing produces no discernible effect. An effect occurs at random in a moment's stillness. It occurs not from any one cause, but in the totality of all causes. If you drop a lump of sugar into a glass of water, you can see that the water is dissolving the sugar. But the moment the sugar dissolves depends on how warm the water is, what the altitude is, what sort of sugar you use, what sort of water and whatever. 
So just as egg precedes chicken, for a discernible cause to exist, there must first be a discernible effect. Our cosmogonies all begin with an effect, the break of dawn. Uh, in, 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 in Buddhist Tantra, it's a sound, a syllable, um, a word, a big bang, bang. So no sooner does an effect occur than motion comes along and causes what resulted to evolve towards any number of new ends all at the same time. Causation defines reality only so far as the motion of something appro uh, approaches the moment of transformation. In that moment, motion gives way to stillness, a stillness that results not from the way any one thing is tending, but a confluence of the motion of all things as a product of chance. Biology's, hy uh, biology's hy uh, philosophical hypothesis that the origins of species are caused by evolution through natural selection and that mankind thereof evolved from apes is, frankly, not supported by science. Belief in survival of the fittest as the cause of the origins of species is but a vanity, a chasing after the wind. And it's not bad to chase the wind. I chase the wind, too. So um, it's but a vanity, a chasing after the wind. For the science of the matter, the preacher preaches so. I return so on. The race is not to the swift. It's not to the survival of the fittest. What happens? Time and chance happeneth to them all. So someone knew something. So um, uh, anyway, yeah. So time is transformative. Motion evolves, th motion evolves things into other things over time's duration only to a point. Ultimately, things are transformed into other things in the stillness of a moment's time. The wolf was perhaps bred to become ever tamer over duration, but only in a moment's time did the wolf become a dog. In a moment's time, anything is possible. Sad people can become happy, wolves can turn into dogs, pumpkins can turn into carriages, pigs can fly, what is living, what is living can die, and what is dead can come to life. Anything happens in a moment's time. So um, time is perfect. Things are perfect in their moment of inception, and that's it. Worlds are perfectly ordered in their moment of genesis, but fall uh, into sin, air, the moment they begin to turn. Cars are perfect in the showroom, but begin to depreciate the moment you drive them off the lot. Bob Dylan sings, he not busy being born is busy dying. Over, dura over duration, nothing is perfect, save the void. Time is magical. So perfection in the instantaneous transformation of one thing into another is the very essence of magic. And the, world, and the world of magic, its art and tradition, is wholly founded on the science of time, time management. In Sanskrit, two terms associated with magic are ridi, transformation, instantaneous transformation, and siddhi, perfection. A magician is nothing more and nothing less than someone able to accomplish something, make something happen when the chips are down, in time, when it counts. Make your free throws. Time is indeterminate. So, uh, a little vulgarity, shit happens, sorry. So, usually events occur very irregularly. There will be earthquakes, but who knows when. Some events occur with regularity, tides ebb, ebb and flow, geese migrate, flowers bloom, and so on. No event, however, occurs at a determinate time. That rare events such as earthquakes and bomb cyclones happen at the indeterminate moments is obvious, but the indeterminacy of time is true as well for even the most regular of things sunrise, when the train comes, oscillations of cesium. Sunrise is but a chance occurrence resulting, from, uh, uh, resulting not from any one motion, but the totality of all motion. No one knows for certain if or when the sun will rise tomorrow. And if it does, it will happen in its own sweet time. So time is determinative, demonic, fatal. Nature and nurture both influence outcomes, but ultimately determine nothing. Only time will tell. What will be, will be. Gabriel Garcia Marquez wrote Love in the Time of Cholera with the idea that if it hadn't been a time of cholera, things might have been different. <laughs> so on our, on our farm, on the farm, we sow wheat on the same ground year in and year out, but no two wheat crops are ever the same. So derived from Greek, uh, uh, diastai, uh, uh, I'm sorry, to, I don't know, anyway, to, to distribute, apportion, divide. A demon 
is nothing more and nothing less than a moment of time that determines one's share, portion, or lot in life, and thereby governs fate, that which has been spoken. So the great demon of antiquity was the promulgation of the calendar, for its almanac governed peop uh, people's yearly lot in life, the calendar. As the embodiment of a determinative moment in time, demon often stands as an obstacle in the way of destiny. The end to which we believe time as duration is moving us. Sweet Brian Wilson sings, I just wasn't made for these times. So demons are not inherently evil. In Matthew, after Jesus reveals to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem where he will suffer and die, Peter says, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. To which Jesus replies, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. Here, Jesus calls Peter the devil, not because Peter is evil, but because giving in to the things of man over, things, uh, over those of God would rob Jesus of his destiny. It would cheat him of his fate. So time is voluntary. Motion presents opportunities to choose one occasion or another. Robert Frost took the road less traveled by, and that made all the difference for him. But then no sooner do we make one choice than another option uh, uh, arises. Led Zeppelin sang, you know, you know the song. You, you, you all know the song, don't you? Yes, anyway. There are two paths you can go by, but in the long run, there's still time to change the road you're on. So flux ensures free will. <laughs> flux ensures free will to go on making choices for as long as we possess science. Science is about making choices. Anyone who tells you that there is no such thing as free will is either nescient or evil. So time is transient. No occasion lasts forever. With everything constantly in motion, there is always some force pulling us away from the centers we're in time with. Buddhism knows the demon of impermanence holds the created world, our ceaselessly turning samsara, firmly in its clutches. Sandy Denny uh, knew Time's Fleeting Nature too. Do you guys know this song? Who knows where the time goes? It's a nice song, yeah. So, uh, Anyway, time is creative. Science precedes the existence of time, and knowledge of time precedes the creation of the physical world. Without the relative stillness of a moment's time, all would be one and undifferentiated chaos. But in a moment's time, we know the dawn of Genesis. We know our world as an eternal state. We know a point of reference, center, horizon, four directions. Uh, we know the limits to things. We know the spirits or genie that make things individual what they are. We know their names. We know their physical properties. All comes in time, moment of time, we know it. Yeah. Though time itself is begotten, it is in time that all things are made. Time is revelatory. What we know of reality in terms of time's duration is ever less than perfect. We are never certain if or when something will happen. We may be confident that, su that the sun will rise tomorrow and know with fair accuracy when, but we do not know these things for sure. By defining time merely as what a clock measures, natural philosophy or physics waves certainty and limits itself to a world of probabilities that fall within zero and one. This self-imposed constraint serves a purpose and can be very useful in pushing limits. More and more these days, however, in insisting on its own way, its philosophers assert that certainty does not exist at all, that knowing something to an imprecise degree of probability is the best that anyone can do, and that only physicists can attain that degree. This assertion is total bullshit, sorry, and pushes nescience to the point of tyranny. Certainty exists in a moment's time when stillness lends veritas. Certainty comes to us in a moment's clarity. Well, I'll be damned, I know where my keys are. It comes to us in revelation. Albert Einstein saw time's relativity as a revelation in white light. In a moment's time, Buttercup knew the farm boy, Wesley, loved her. Right? Time is divine. The truth that time reveals is of God, the metaphysical agency upon which our worlds depend for the nature to nature. The 6th century Indian astronomer and polymath Varamahira says, the divine knowledge which pertains to time delights the minds of man. So, Time has determined the relationship between science and religion. P 
pure science is subjective and exists only from moment to moment. We constantly return to the void, refix a point of reference, reassume the center, reobserve the horizon, and so on. For this limitation, science alone cannot create the world. To create a world that endures over time's duration for ourselves and others requires settling upon a conventional semblance of order and maintaining that order as religion. In our conventional constructs are science and religion both, inextricably linked. As we live and breathe, we orient by fixed points of reference. That we do so is quintessentially scientific. In order to create world order, on the other hand, we must choose a conventional point of reference and maintain it over time's duration. Doing this is quintessentially religious. In our world's first point of Aries, for example, are science and religion both. There is no way to separate them. You can't get them apart ever. It's impossible. I could put the date up here. In that date, there's lots of science that goes, whatever the date is today, there's lots of science that goes into that. Well, that's our religion. Nothing is more religious than whatever day it is today, uh, right? Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, yeah. This, but still, at their end, science and religion are qualitatively different things. The science necessary to create a world is timeless. It never changes. Not for anyone, anywhere. All peoples face the void, fix a point of reference, assume the center, know time and space, observe the horizon, all of this stuff, and so on again and again and again. Religion, on the other hand, is subject to duration. It changes over time. This is what the Tao Te Ching says. The way that is the right will not always be the way. Things are going to change. So, um, yeah. How obviously true this is, right? It's just true. And yet how antithetical to modern philosophy. So anyway, for flux, temporal order does not exist in absolute objective terms, but rather has to be made. Methods of time reckoning are known through science and maintained in religion, but created as art. In Enuma Elish, upon slaying the chaos drag dragon Tiamat, Marduk uh, does artful works to create the cosmos. There is no one right way to regulate time. This is a Mongolian Buddhist manual. The Kalachakras is one way, all of these different things. Yeah. Uh, in reckoning with the motions of the sun, moon, and stars, uh, let's see, uh, yeah. Uh, in reckoning with the motions of the sun, moon, and stars, the calendar maker seeks a moment that defines a multiple in days of both the month and the year. Unfortunately, no such moment has ever been found. The day itself is a mutable construct uh, uh, that can be defined in any number of discrete ways. Buddhist astronomers know three kinds of day. The longest day is the zodiac or sidereal day, the time it takes the sun to progress one out of 360 degrees of the zodiac, or 360 days, uh, uh, such days in the year. The second kind of day is the doin, the solar, natural day, 365 something or whatever, and then the lunar day. Our world is founded on a fabrication the fabrication of a firmament. From a conventionally chosen center, we erect imaginary colliers that sync the four directions with the four seasons relative to a conventionally chosen prime meridian. This convention stops the world from turning by turning heaven into a solid state. The act was oft likened to the fettering of chaos in a net. Anuma Elish says, I'm going to bind you in a net. Uh, Hoinanza says basically the same thing. Straight of the four binding cords when they create order. So fabrication of this cosmic net creates a matrix, a womb to protect us from the void. Reticulated with meridians and parallels likened to the warp and weft threads of a woven gar garment, it becomes a celestial canopy emblazoned with stars. Now the stars affixed to this canopy are not as fixed as they might seem. People said that in times of calamity, even the stars lose their way. Numbers, however, do not. Beginning in ancient Mesopotamia, astronomers came to define the terms of the celestial canopy through numerical abstraction. In scientific terms, whereas chaotic motion is everlasting, time as measured duration is by definition a limited time a certain period that extends only from one, uh, one uh, event to another. 
So conceiving of space and time in abstract numerical terms, however, engenders the notion of a celestial order that in theory need never go astray. Boundless duration, world without end, everlasting life. It's all the, 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 in, the, in the abstract. There's no reason to change the numbers. They just stay there forever. So think of this celestial canopy as a cosmic dome tent. It makes heaven round, the earth flat and square, has a fixed empirical center and a limited fixed horizon. Even a baby can't get lost in it. Its time is uniform, bong. If it's 2 p.m. in one place, it's 2 p.m. everywhere, or whatever time this is now. So time itself begins with its creation and moves it, like a flying arrow towards the future. Potentially, its duration is infinite, never ending. This very beguiling perception of reality is, however, but an illusion. Step outside of the cosmic dome tent into the wilderness, and what do you find? There's no center there, no colliers, no flat square earth, no absolute duration in time. It's the void that awaits. So for the sovereign who creates it, this illusory net is a net gain. It creates an order that can, that can long endure, sustain life, and even bring prosperity. For subjects, however, this net of illusion can be a devil's snare. It frees you as it frees the sovereign if you know it for what it is, but binds you to an imposing superstition if you come to think it's real. Buddhism knows the reality of this net of illusion, how it binds one to the things of the material world and seeks to liberate sentient beings from its fetters. In Tantric Buddhism, where the truth of two-in-one is affirmed in seeing the human form as a microcosm of the universe, a yogic practice was known as Mahamudra, the great seal. It's designed to free one from exactly this net of cosmic illusion. That's what it's all about. So uh, though Buddhism manages to slip its noose, philosophy gets wildly entangled in this net of cosmic illusion. So this is, uh, 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 this is Plato in Timaeus. The sight of the day and then the months and the revolutions that have created number, this abstraction, and have given us a conception of time, it's boundless time, and the power of inquiring about the nature of the universe, and from this source we have derived philosophy, and off we go. Right? So philosophy of time divides the world into Orient and Occident. The East retaining the science of time, uh, uh, the distinction between instant and duration, and the West yielding to faith in the possibility of realizing boundless time sometime in the future. So for Buddhist philosophy of time, Alex and Bob, who aren't with us today, but uh, 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 Professor Von Rospat and Professor Sharp, um, uh, are, are both experts. So uh, uh, Dr. Von Rospat has a book called uh, The Buddhist Doctrine of Momentariness. Uh, during the Redux workshop, uh, uh, Professor Scharf gave a talk uh, on what physicists can learn from medieval Buddhist debates over the nature of time. So they can tell you that there is more to it than this. But fundamentally in Buddhism, instantaneousness of being is the ultimately real thing, the only thing in the universe that is a non-construction, a non-fiction, the real basis of all constructions. It's truth grounded squarely in empirical observation. For a similar, similarly succinct survey of Western philosophy, in a brief history of time, Stephen Hawking says that, everybody believes in, West, uh, in, in absolute time is what he says. All right, in 1905, Einstein's paper on the special theory of relativity upset philosophy's apple cart. His theory replaced the Newtonian notion of absolute time with a notion of time as reference frame and spatial position. Rather than an invariant time interval between events, he posits an invariant space-time interval relative to the speed of light. What this means is that in order to tell the time of, of an event, Whereas in Newtonian physics, the clock might be anywhere. And if you think about it as something that measures duration, should only be in one spot. You should not move that. Uh, uh, or in Newtonian physics, the clock might be anywhere. For Einstein, you have to place a stationary clock as close to the site of the actual event as possible. So this is how Einstein describes it. Right. So Einstein's theory defines the nature of time as duration but not time itself, the occasion in, uh, uh, but not time itself. Einstein's interposition of a clock as that which tells time is a surreptitious substitution for light itself and the clock's numbers for allegory. 
We know empirically that telling the time of an event with light itself and with what a clock measures are qualitatively different things. We saw that. Like the Zurvanites of yore, Einstein conflated everlasting with eternity, duration with occasion, and so missed the most basic distinction in all the world, something we differentiate in our daily lives with perfect ease. Why did Einstein err? Because Einstein sees time in terms of motion that exists in stillness rather than stillness existing in flux. Einstein's theory does not account for the brute fact that nothing is stationary. So what's wrong with this picture? The, observ the observer's not moving is what's wrong with the picture. Einstein realized his mistake himself, but rather than admit to it, he cheated. In 1917, he interposed into his mathematical model of the universe an, Amer an, an imaginary cosmological constant, an abstract numerical value created to create a static eternal formulation of the universe. This value, which offset, offsets the force of gravity, negates what his numbers otherwise showed to be in motion. In, 1920, uh, in 1927, Georges Lemaitre, if that's how you say his name, revealed a calculation showing that the universe must be expanding, expanding from something smaller, something infinitesimally small, a big bang. When in 1931 Edwin Hubble confirmed the empirical reality of an expanding universe, Einstein retracted his imaginary constant. In 1927 the other shoe dropped when Werner Heisenberg published his uncertainty principle. Using subatomic particles and our fantastic ability to measure distance and velocity, he showed the futility of clocks to accurately determine the position of bodies moving at a given velocity. His principle gives that the position and the momentum of an object cannot both be measured exactly at the same time, even in theory. When the position of an object is known with certainty, its momentum is entirely uncertain and vice versa. For me, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle was a breakthrough for us. It does what philosophy is supposed to do. It explains through inquiry what we know to be true through cognition, through science. Heisenberg saw by measuring subatomic particles what the calendar maker sees using a gnomon to observe the sun. When we know where something is, it's not moving, it's still. Notwithstanding my opinion, that of Niels Bohr who championed it, or the field of quantum physics which has grown from it, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle has not made the same intellectual and societal impact as Newton's laws or even Einstein's relativity theory. Historians of natural philosophy wonder why this is, but for the historian of science, the reason is very, very plain to see. Our world, Western civilization, is built on a foundation of faith in the unempirical existence of infinite duration or boundless time. In his letter to Max Born, Einstein wrote, quantum theory yields much but hardly brings us closer to the old one's secrets. I, in any case, am convinced God doesn't play dice with the universe. All right? No. Uh, uh, Einstein, of course, uh, was wrong about this. So in a neat video, Breaking the Wall of Illusion, How Quantum Physics Question Our Perception of Reality, Anton Zeilinger simply turns on a photon clicker to demonstrate the objectivity of randomness. But see here that Einstein eschews science. Let's go back. Einstein eschews science for faith in something unempirical an immutable order in nature yet unrealized. Whether he intended them so or not, Einstein's words, God does not play dice, have been taken politically to justify the rejection of science in our world. For these politics, Einstein's words have furthered modernity's ill-fated attempt to circumscribe all reality under the purview of natural philosophy. We as individuals know the science of time. We don't have to bat an eye to distinguish occasion and duration. Our governments in making our calendars know the science of time. Our engineers and orologists know time. But dogma of the dominant religion of our time makes no allowance for the science of time at all. Joni Mitchell uh, sings 
uh, uh, something's lost, something's gained in living every day. Ignoring the science of time comes with certain benefits. The magic of our clocks brings us iPhones, drones, self-driving cars, robots. It enables us to hit an asteroid with a dart. But at what cost? Ignorance of time traps physicists in Zeno's paradox, building better and better clocks to bring our ability to measure rate of motion nearer and nearer to the point of stillness so that we might one day catch a tortoise. Confla and this is important. Conflating duration with occasion creates socio-political mud. Do we really want to live forever but as a machine? You want that? Uh, 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 or do we really want a machine to speak for us? If we knew what time was, if we knew what time was, we wouldn't think to think in these very muddled terms. Ignorance of time has blinded us to cause and effect. Interpreting data shows us the path uh, we happen to be traveling at the moment, but reveals absolutely <coughs> nothing about what is going to happen and where we'll be in time. If we knew what time was, we'd think twice about limiting our knowledge to mere facts. Ignorance of time encloses our humanity in an ever-shrinking bubble. It makes anyone who does not cotton to our religion some holy, monstrous other. It obliviates our past. Wherein lies the science of humanity, if not in the humanities? But who remembers that? The science of humanity is predicated on the science of time. Scripture, literature, and art are steeped in allegory of the celestial phenomena people used to tell time. If we think that second, minute, hour, day, month, and year are defined by oscillations of cesium and not the movements of sun, moon, planets, and stars, how on earth can we possibly interpret the science of art? It's impossible. <laughs> the first law of hermeneutics <laughs> is the unicorn lion law. It states that if you see a unicorn and a lion together in a text and assume that the lion is a real lion and the unicorn something totally imaginary, guess again. For Eurasian peoples at mid-latitudes in the northern hemisphere, the lion kills the unicorn is an allegorical trope of seasonal opposition with the unicorn, the Pleiades, horn of Taurus, sign of the equinoxes, and Regulus, metonym for Leo the Lion, sign of the solstices. So I leave you with a passage from Job. My days are swifter than a runner. They flee by and see no good. They sweep by as a skiff of papyrus, an eagle swooping on its prey. So we know the text is supposed to be depressing because Job was famously depressed. <laughs> but if we take its meaning at face value, what's so depressing about it? A reed boat floating along a river is a beautiful image. An eagle swooping on the prey isn't all that depressing either, unless you happen to be eagle prey. Right? Hebrew poetry is famous for forms of repetition that hone meaning to a point. Is there a point being honed to here, or does the passage blow off into the wind like chicken feathers? Oh. It's when we read the passage allegorically that science brings its meaning home. The day of Job is the common day, the solar day. My day is swifter than a runner. The runner is a constellation of among the fixed stars, Perseus. In the relativity of time, Job's solar day is approximately four minutes faster than the sidereal day of Perseus. Why do Job's days see no good? because the skiff of papyrus sweeping by is a metonym of sovereign power, the science of the sun traversing the ecliptic in the religion of potentates who use it to govern time on earth and thereby subjugate the likes of Job under timely obligations that can be onerous. That his day is like an eagle swooping on its prey only hones the meaning to a fine point. The book of Job is thought to have been written in the 5th, 4th century BC during the, during the Persian Empire. At this time, Cyrus the Great and the Persians had turned the royal falcon of the Egyptians into a swooping eagle and made it the symbol of their military power. It's also Ahura Mazda 
and the, the royal falcon and all of that. The passage tells us that Job was oppressed by his overlord's manipulation of time. Living under an oppressive government, time was dolorous and harrowing for him. There was absolutely nothing he could do about it. And that's depressing. So, we who are citizens of so-called free nations are sovereign by right. But so long as we re remain ignorant of the science of time, those who would seek to oppress us will continue to use time to subjugate us as time was used to subjugate Job. Time is of the essence to everything that we hold dear, and the time for its redemption is now. That's my little talk. So such as it is. All right. So yeah, thank you for a great talk. It's, uh, there are a lot of interesting ideas, many of which I admit I don't really understand. But uh, I have a question about uh, when you talk about the relationship between time and motion. Uh -huh. uh, so, so what I have in mind is this problem that came up in some quarters of Buddhist philosophy, where you know they they start from the idea that everything is impermanent, which got to this point where everything is so impermanent that they only exist for a single moment. Mm -hmm. But then some some people go even further and they say you know everything being in, being only momentary, you know means that there's only a series of static moments, so there's no motion whatsoever. Right. So. It, comes to this kind of end point where there's no motion, there's that, that things don't actually move right. from one temporal position to another. Right. Everything just stays in their own position right. temporally. People, so I wonder what would you say, like, is that just the wrong way of looking at things? Yeah, well, yeah, so, so it's a logical way, it's a philosophical way, and, and people, uh, people claim that uh, that's Zeno, uh, 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 Zeno's way of looking at it, that he just sees a state of, state of universe. Um, uh, what I tried to show is um, uh, the world's not logical. So um, there are logical ends. We know everything, we know nothing, objectivity, a subjectivity, a uh, 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 stillness motion. One of the things I left out of this talk was a continuum. So, uh, uh, and, and uh, I just, I felt I didn't have time, but it's sort of important. So, uh, and the way I teach this, along with other con uh, 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 concepts, is in terms of continua. So things from, from, from stillness to motion, from subjectivity to objectivity, from, um, um, from whatever it is. And, and what happens along that? Things start out so, all from void to perfect order. And they always go the same way. The thing we start with on the continuum is something that we know. We know subjectivity. We know the void. We know the moment in time. We know these things. And then Time as, time as an instant. As we move towards the, this, this end, the end, it's, the, the end out here is a conceptual thing. And the, the thing I wanted to talk about is how do we come by this idea of constancy? So all of, all of this stuff we do with clocks and all of that, it's based on an idea that there's constancy. It doesn't exist. It's in our minds. It's a product of sapience. And, and that, that's with all things. If you think about, you know, what, what, so from science to philosophy, our science is sure. The void is real. Fix a point of brevity. It's not going anywhere. But when we get to philosophy, zoop, we get to this asymptote that approaches something and, does, and, doesn't, and doesn't reach it. And for me, so I, I don't know how, the impression that I give. I'm very much about this asymptote. I'm not against, uh, 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 you know, I'm for the whole thing. I'm not, you know, we, we need to go back to the Stone Age kind of thing. But th that would be my answer. So what do you mean by the continuum? I didn't quite understand how that word fits into it. Uh, yeah, I wish I, I wish I'd left it in. But um, 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 uh, yeah. Um, uh, You're talking about the movement from one. Yeah, from one end to the other. So so lots of things are 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 are, are on. It's uh, uh, it's it starts with this one thing and it heads towards this opposing thing. That if it were real, if you could realize it, it would make this other thing go away. So things are just like this. You know, so there's an interrelationship between time as as instant and time as duration. So you're saying that because you can't realize it, we're always in the continuum. And the continuum. Yeah, you're all. We're always in the continuum so that somewhere. Is the, the, the nature of reality. Yeah, the nature of reality is in the, in the continuum. Yeah.
Thank you, Brian. It was a really great talk, and I especially appreciated your use of songs, uh, including sometimes <laughs> very old songs and sometimes very new songs. But it got me to wonder how, I think there was a lot of sort of visual metaphors also in analysis, and it seems like the idea of observation, our eyes, is very important for the different ways in which you're charting time. But thinking about songs and rhythm and rhyme, I wonder how that might fit into your sort of what kind of time is it that we feel when when something rhymes, when a song rhymes? Um, is 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 rhythm of our language? Is that a clock or a gnomon? Yeah, that, so that, that that's another thing I do with music. They're both. You have to have both. So things are in time over time. I, 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 I don't have time to do it here, but, 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 another, but time. another time. But music is exactly that, where you want to be in time over time. And you think about like when you get out of sync, right? Or, or the pitches, you know, you know, you're out of time. You know, it's a, and, and there's another, you, you talked about sight. So if you, th you, you don't have to do it in sight, in, in terms of sight. I was walking today, we have another a number of people who uh, are blind, and they're constantly picking, fixing a point of reference as they go. But it's, a, you know, um, anyway. Yeah. Mark. So you, what you just said to me, think, think about um, harmony and disharmony yeah. musically. And how disharmony, when you hear disharmony, if a musician is performing and plays a chord that's not in the harmonic structure of the song, as you have heard it. Yeah. You're waiting for the resolution. Right. So the disharmony pushes you in a certain direction. Right. And you're like reaching out to demand right. the harmonic resolution. Exactly. And I wonder if this, these disjointed points on the continuum work in the same way. In other words, the sun goes down, and we're kind of, excuse me, fucked up until the sun comes up again. Yeah. It, and that may be a big cause of dukkha and anxiety because we sort of can't, unpredictable nature, predictably unpredictable nature of things yeah. creates this inevitable anxiety where we're looking for the, cor the harmonic chord again. Let's get, right. yeah, you see what I'm saying? Does yeah, I, I see, in, 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 uh, in our, uh, uh, the pro seminar we were talking about figura and, and things like that, it, you're, 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 you're manipulating time when you, when you use that disharmony, dis, uh, uh, discord to try to come to re some resolution, resolution, if you do or not, you know, but they've got you. Yeah. I mean, the musicians certainly do that intentionally. And they're very intentionally. Yeah, and then they keep the audience to hold on you. You go to a jazz concert and, and you can't take your mind off what you're hearing. Right. Because it's not resolved yet. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. God will come in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you. So oh, there's one more. Are the Z left? physics to become a poet. Oh. And he was here. And um, I have all this poetry. But I find in poetry, perhaps as demonstrated in your songs, that search towards verbalizing your space in the two concepts. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I shouldn't say this, but uh, uh, I'm trying to do better musically. Uh, so I, I have a caveman sense of, of music, and, and so uh, I really want, and all people around me are so, Mark is very good with, with jazz. Uh, I, know, I know a lot of country music, three chords and a cloud of dust. But, but the, the lyrics to those things are nice. That, that old Don Gibson knew a lot about the nature of time, and they go back and forth. They say that time heals a broken heart. Time has stood still since we've been apart. And that Sandy Denny song, who knows where the time goes, how perfect that is. This is beautiful understanding. I think the interaction exists in the poem, in the mind of the poet. And, wow. and the ability to express it. Right. It, that it exists, and, and they talk about, oh, it means anything, and no, it doesn't. It's, it, that's in the mind of the poet, and that's the thing that they're moving you with, that they want to express. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. I have a question about 
uh, like the implication of all this reflection of our writing history like in our department, most of our training are uh, like historical training. And when we write history, we kind of operate on this conventional sense of time. Yeah. Um, so now there is all this very cutting edge reflection of time. Does that like have any implication on how we write history? How we write history? Yeah. Like, yeah, right. I no, I I I see the question. Yeah, the no, I see the question. No, I see the question. Yeah, yeah, because I teach courses in history, so I should be able to go into that, go into history teaching mode. Yeah. So 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 so, and that's the thing. So, it's what what I'm. How how can I say this? Faith is a very good thing. I'm a faith-based person. I you know, somewhere over the rainbow, uh, bluebirds fly, uh, and, and all of that. But uh, 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 if I, I shouldn't do this, but. Um, uh, Jesus said, uh, man can't live by faith alone. You have to, uh, no, he didn't say that, I say that. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, said, Jesus said, man can't live by bread alone. You have to have some faith. What I say is you, you can't live by faith alone. You have to have a little bit of science. Uh, and, so, and, and so all of that said, all of this faith is a wonderful thing, and, and chronology is an incredible thing. And that's the thing when I teach uh, uh, historical. Uh, so there's a lot of history that's maybe theoretical or focused in, you know, some. Use chronology. Chronology is th that's what it's there for. Is for for telling history. It's very very helpful. You don't have to on this day or that. But anyway, I'm I'm, I'm a big fan of, of chronology and history. Uh, all the while knowing that it's history. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's, it's illusory. Yes. And then what's the point of us writing history? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, that, well, I'm not against all this immortality and, immor you know, all, it's, it, it, it's not, it, it's, not, I'm not against it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. Um, uh, Bill. Well, not just history, but aren't many of the academic disciplines and humanities still captured by this enlightenment concept of determinism? And does it affect uh, research and the work? And the well, I, um, I, I, I imagine so. I don't know that. Uh, so, yeah, other, maybe. Could, maybe. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, Brian.